Welcome to Sounds of IBM. The sound that you heard was from IBM Quantum Computer. Lex Kid is crying from a distance. And the white thing that you saw is a fridge. They call it Crystat. It's just a box to keep cold inside and shield the noise from the outside. Actually, the whole cylinder can be taken off and at the bottom of the machine is the core part of the quantum computer, the quantum chip. IBM also released a video to demonstrate how quantum computer works. In this demo, as you can see, the quantum computer is connected to a laptop. The laptop will send out two signals to the quantum computer. And these two signals will go to the quantum chip, where it's at the bottom of the quantum computer and then the quantum computer will compute these two signals and send the results back to the laptop. Is that the end of this video? No, it's the beginning. What's up guys, welcome to my channel. My name is Benson, master's student studying in Singapore and currently doing a research on quantum computer hardware at ASTAR. Before we dive in, this video is divided into four parts and you can feel free to jump to a specific section by using the timestamp on the progress bar. Let's get into it. All the computers that we are now using on databases are classical computers like this lightweight MacBook on which I can watch videos and do some paperwork or like the supercomputers on which I can do some heavy work such as climate modeling or something that requires more computing power. But basically, whether uh, this person computer or supercomputers, they're all the same because they're all based on the same processing unit called bit. And bit only has two values. 0 and 1. Actually, early classical computers were not based on 0 and 1. They were based on continuous signals, such as from 0 to 1, uh, like 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. This is not a good idea because the signals that we want to send are based on the voltage we apply. But the voltage is not stable. So, say for example, if I want to send 0 0.1, but due to the unstable voltage, chances are I will get 0 0.2. That is called an error. An error is something that we don't want to see. So that is why people switched to binary signals such as 0 and 1. And this can be realized by a transistor. Okay, here I will use this coin to replace 0 and 1 because this coin has two different colors on either side. So it's a good example for a bit. Different than classical computers, quantum computers are composed of basic unit called qubit. Qubit is the abbreviation of quantum bit and qubit has some interesting features such as superposition and entanglement. So what is superposition? Uh, let's take a look at this coin first. Imagine this is a bit in a classical computer and you can either show the red side or the yellow side but you cannot show the red or yellow at the same time, right? So this exactly resembles a bit in a classical computer. But what does a qubit look like? Watch, I'll spin it. When it's spinning, you cannot tell which color is on because the bit is now at the superposition state and becomes a qubit. Red color and yellow color are displayed at the same time. Superposition is very tricky. It will only happen in a clean and isolated space where there is no interaction with the environment. So that is why you saw the big fridge in the beginning, right? You remember? And any interaction with the environment will cause the superposition to collapse, including our observation. Wait, what is collapse? Okay, let me show you. So technically, we cannot see a superposition because every time we see it, it will collapse. Probably you will say, that's all? So what? What are we supposed to do with this? For example, for classical computers, if we want to get the sequence from all the combinations of these three colors, we have to try different combinations one by one, which is time consuming. But with the quantum computer, we can use only three qubits to represent all the possible combinations and find the one that we want at once. Because each qubit is at the superposition state of red and yellow. But do you think we can only use superposition to achieve this parallel computing? No we have to use another feature called entanglement and I will talk about that in the next section. 
Okay, so if we can do this parallel computing, but how can we get the result out of it? Because it's spinning, right? Well, in a quantum computer, every time we want to get a value out of a qubit, we have to make an observation, which will cause the superposition to collapse. Since we cannot control the collapsing result, how can we get the result that we want? Say if we want to get the sequence over here. If we want to get the result that we want, instead of the random results, we have to use something called entanglement. And entanglement will happen between two or more qubits. So now I will use this two coins to demonstrate this entanglement. Imagine these two spinning coins are two qubits and they're entangled. If I measure the value of one of the qubits, the other one will collapse to a specific value at the same time. Because the collapse of two qubits happens simultaneously, so if there are two entangled qubits, I have one and you have another, I'm on Earth and you're on Mars, when I observe the state of mind, yours will turn into a corresponding state at the same time. Like a magic, right? These two qubits are like communicating with each other at a speed which is way faster than light. And Einstein called this phenomenon spooky action at a distance. So in this way, if we want to find out the result of this sequence like this, we can entangle four qubits by a mechanism called quantum gate. Since every qubit can be affected by other qubits, then we can use different combinations of gates to in some ways control the qubits to get the result. That is called quantum algorithm. Just like algorithms in classical computers which control bits to perform certain tasks, quantum algorithms control qubits to do the same task but in a much faster way. It may seem easy to build physical qubits, but in practice, I can tell you, it's really, really hard. The most troublesome issue is called decoherence, and I can use this coin to explain. The physical qubit is just like the spinning coin, spins perfectly at the beginning, but after a while, it will start to wobble, wobble, and wobble, and finally lies flat. And the whole process is called decoherence. There are many reasons for decoherence, such as vibration, radiation, or any interaction with the environment. So that is why qubits are very, very fragile and always kept in ultra-cold containers, such as the one that you saw in the beginning, the wide cylinder that is a fridge, to reduce the environmental influence as much as possible. Aside from decoherence, error is not a big problem in quantum computing. Scientists and researchers in the world are now getting to race to fabricate different qubits. And there are many ways to do it, such as superconducting qubits, uh, trapped ion qubits, and photonic qubits, semiconductor qubits. I'll make a video about how to build these qubits later. The mainstream technique now is the superconducting qubits. Giant tech companies like IBM, Google are working on this type. But I choose to work on semiconductor qubits because it's more compatible with the nowadays highly advanced semiconductor industry and I think it will work. Okay, that's pretty much it. Thank you guys for watching and catch you guys in the next one. Peace.